Normally when people think about ancient civilizations in the Western Hemisphere, they think of the, the great civilizations of the Maya in Mexico or the, the Inca in Peru. But in fact, there did develop complex cultures or, or civilizations in the United States, uh, in what would become the United States. And these cultures include the mound builders uh, who lived in the Mississippi Valley and the rivers that feed the Mississippi River. This also included the, the Anasazi cultures of the American Southwest. And finally, in today's lesson, we're going to look at the impact of European exploration and colonization on Native American cultures. So let's first begin by examining what are the features of complex cultures. <clears throat> and complex cultures are, are a bit different than the simple cultures we looked at in the, in the first lesson. First of all, uh, number one, in, in a complex culture, you have to have an agricultural surplus. What that means is that the people in that culture have to produce food, not just for their families, but for everybody else. And that's the key. So you have to have enough the technology to produce an abundant amount of agricultural goods, or a, a, abundant amounts of food anyway. Second of all, that agricultural surplus allows for specialization. In a complex culture, with spe um, people can specialize learning a particular craft, learning a, a particular trade, because they don't have to worry about producing food for themselves. They can get that food through an exchange system with those people who produce the food. Another feature of a complex culture is what we call social stratification, in the sense that people in a complex culture are divided into classes, uh, and they're stratified, like think of, a, of, a, of a layers of a cake. And uh, people at the, at the top generally enjoy a lifestyle and power and influence that's much greater than people at the bottom. Also, what we find in a complex culture is that you have some kind of formal system of government. Think of government as kind of a form of specialization. You, in other words, you have people whose job and priority is to maintain law and order and keep the system working. So now that we understand what the features are of a complex culture, Let's look first at the mound builders. Now, the, the mound builder cultures are actually a number of different cultures whose common characteristic is that they built these giant mounds of, of earth. And uh, one of the earliest mound builder cultures is called the Poverty Point culture. Now, this culture flourished uh, around 1700 BC, which would mean that it was almost 4,000 years ago. And, uh, what, was, what we see at the Poverty Point culture, which was located in the lower Mississippi Valley in what is today Louisiana, was that uh, they produced these huge uh, giant mounds that are in the shape of uh, concentric circles, kind of like, looks like a C if you look at it from a satellite image. And, and, the, and this was uh, huge. And also, the Poverty Point culture built what we call effig an effigy mound. An effigy mound is a a mound of earth that's shaped like an animal or a bird. In the case of Poverty Point, uh, at Poverty Point, they built an effigy mound that was 600 feet in length and uh, was in the shape of a, of a giant bird in flight. Um, now, what, the reason why we can look at this, these remains and conclude that we had a, a complex culture here is that we know for a fact that these mounds were built over a very short period of time, over decades. And to build such a giant structure would require, first of all, a large population. So we're, you needed to have large numbers of people living in a town or some kind of large settlement. Also, government. You need, somebody had to be in charge of running this operation and building these mounds. So we have evidence from the mounds of both political organization and a certain degree of urbanization. Now, at Poverty Point, they did not yet know Indian corn. That had not yet arrived. But we do know from archaeological remains that they found a way to, to fish, to, to, uh, to find animals and, and game and fish uh, in large quantities to support a very large population. Also at, FG, at the um, Poverty Point culture, they found uh, uh, jewelry and ornament, personal adornments that show a high degree of sophistication in terms of workmanship. So there we see another attribute of a complex culture, specialization. Now, after a poverty point, there's a, a bit of a lull. And then the next big mound builder culture would be, the, would be the Adena culture, which was located in mainly in the upper Ohio Valley in and around Pennsylvania, uh, around 900 BC. And then a little bit later, you find 
the, the Hopewell culture, which uh, was centered in the Ohio, lower Ohio Valley and uh, in the upper Mississippi Valley, so in what would today be the, the Midwest. Now, both the Adena and the Hopewell culture built FG mounds and mounds in different geometric shapes. Now, uh, it's been uh, guessed at, we, all, that's all we have is guesses at this point, that perhaps these mounds served as a place where religious rituals took place, or perhaps these were places where uh, the elite, the, the upper classes, perhaps built their homes. Maybe this is where the rulers lived on top of these mounds. Or we know for a fact that, uh, that these were places that, that people traveled from long distances uh, to, to visit. So there are places of pilgrimage for the peoples who lived in these areas. So here, once again, we see evidence of complex culture. We see the, building these mounds involved organization. Obviously, we had a large population to be able to put these mounds together. Um, now, with the Hopewell culture, we see around, around the birth of Christ, around 2,000 years ago, so we see the first evidence of the arrival of corn and from, it made its way up to the Ohio Valley. And so they were the first people to actually use, uh, to develop agriculture on a large scale, growing corn. Now, one of the most spectacular of the mound builders' cultures is the Mississippian culture. And uh, this Mississippian culture flourished between 900 and 1200 AD. And uh, it was a series of uh, these, these giant mounds. And in the case of the Mississippian culture, the mounds off, off usually take the shape of pyramids, like what you'd find among the Maya or the Aztecs to the south in Mexico and Central America. Now, one of the most spectacular of all these sites is a place called Cahokia. Now, Cahokia is located uh, along the Mississippi River. It's just across from the modern-day city of St. Louis, Missouri, but it's on the Illinois side. And Cahokia, in its heyday, let's say around 1200 AD, was a, a pretty good-sized city. According to the best estimates, it had a population of probably around 20,000 people. So it was a city that was uh, as big as what you would find in Europe in around 1200. So it was a substantial settlement. Now, one of the biggest mounds was Monk's Mound. Uh, and you can still see Monk's Mound if you visit Cahokia today. And Monk's Mound was actually the, humus, the largest, tallest uh, building constructed by humans up until the 19th century. It was, it's a very large, over 100 feet in, in size. So it was a, a very, the largest man-made structure uh, in, nor, in the United States, the continental the United States. Now, with the Mississippian culture, we can see all kinds of signs of complex culture. Uh, obviously, building these mounds involved political organization. Also, uh, they lived in a big city, which is another aspect of a complex culture. Also, um, we know that uh, by the time we get to the Mississippian culture, they were developing pottery and uh, also even working with copper to produce uh, jewelry and uh, other implements. So, so obviously they had specialized craftsmen uh, who were involved in the production of these goods. Also, they, we find that on these mounds, these mounds served as places of ritual. They also probably served as residences of the elite. And also, they served as burial grounds. So basically, only the elite were buried. The, the wealthiest, most powerful, the leaders of society were buried on these mounds. Now, for some reason, we don't, isn't quite clear. After 1200, these, the mound builder culture, the Mississippian culture, begin to decline. There's evidence that the cities were slowly abandoned, and this would mean that the population was in decline. And uh, we're not really sure why. Uh, one theory holds that uh, a prolonged drought, a prolonged drought due to climate change of some sort, might have uh, lowered harvests of corn and other foodstuffs, and that might have led to uh, disease, epidemic disease, and, and uh, malnutrition. And that might have resulted in the decline of the civilization. Perhaps there was some kind of migration. We know for a fact that uh, the Cherokee and other peoples uh, who, in, in historical period, lived in, the, uh, in Tennessee, where actually their homeland was far to the north. So we know that just prior to the arrival of Europeans, there was a lot of migration going on, and perhaps these migrations were a factor in the decline of the mound-built civilization. But 
But it's important to remember that it didn't disappear completely. Uh, when the French arrived uh, in the 17th century and began to colonize and explore the Mississippi Valley, they found the Natchez people. And the Natchez people were still building mounds when the French arrived. And uh, so we, we can get an insight maybe to how the mountain people cultures lived by looking at the Natchez people. For example, among the Natchez, the ruler was called the Great Sun, and he lived on top of the mound. And uh, all of his subjects worshipped him as a god. So, uh, and so perhaps that was maybe the Natchez people give us an insight to how the much larger, more advanced, uh, complex cultures of the earlier mound builders, how their society functioned. Okay, now we're going to turn to a, a very different complex culture, and that was the culture that developed in the American Southwest, in Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, you know, uh, and we're talking about the Anasazi. Um, Anasazi means the ancient ones, and uh, the Navajo who lived in that area in the historic period, when, when they talked about the ancient inhabitants of the region, they referred, them to, referred to them as the Anasazi, the ancient ones. And archaeologists have found that these, these civilizations were quite remarkable. Um, one of the most re remarkable Anasazi civilizations was located in northern New Mexico in what is today uh, Chaco Canyon. And this, this civilization really flourished around 1100 AD. Now what marks off the Chaco Canyon and many of the Anasazi civilizations are the construction of these big giant pueblos. Uh, that's a Spanish word. But, uh, but a pueblo is a, a, was these buildings made of adobe brick, you know, mud brick, that uh, were huge. Like at Chaco Canyon, some of the pueblos are uh, over a thousand rooms in size. I mean, you can kind of think of them as, as Anasazi skyscrapers. Now at Chaco Canyon, you had a series of pueblos that were linked by a series of well-constructed roads that link them together. And some historians have said, have argued that uh, looking at the placement of the pueblos, it, the, the pueblos functioned as a giant calendar, that the pueblos were built on certain areas to mark the different seasons, the, the passage of the sun across the sky over the spring and the summer and the winter and the fall. Now another thing, another aspect of the Chaco Canyon is they found at the pueblo a giant kiva. Now, in the historic people, in the historic age, peoples like the Hopi and the Navajo built kivas, and they're a place of religious ritual. Uh, it's, it's like a circular-shaped build structure where it's often subterranean, where people will enter in and they conduct rituals. So the discovery of a kiva at Chaco Canyon seems to indicate that you have a degree of continuity from the ancient civilization of Chaco Canyon to the modern day, or not the modern day, or at least the historic Navajo and Hopi who lived in the Southwest in the historic period. Now, uh, now after, after 1100, Chaco Canyon, the pueblos there, appear to be abandoned. And again, we don't know what happened. It could have been, uh, they, they relied on rainfall to support their irrigation and their crops. Perhaps a prolonged drought, a prolonged drought may have been the demise. Maybe it was, uh, Migration, we know that the Navajo and the Apache who lived in the Southwest uh, migrated to that area from what is today Nevada and Utah, so perhaps migrations had something to do with it. Uh, but after the decline of Chaco Canyon, though, they, they continued to build pueblos, and there was cultural continuity, except that the pueblos weren't of the same size. They weren't nearly as complex or, or as big as the ones built at Chaco Canyon. So there's a continuity, it's just that there's just the complexity, a, a lower degree of complexity than you found at, at an earlier period. Now, another d distinct civilization from Chaco Canyon, another Anasazi civilization, is the Hohokam that uh, were located in what is today Arizona. In fact, uh, um, the modern city of Phoenix, Arizona is built on top of a sizable Hohokam uh, city. And, and in fact, uh, the, 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 the roads of Phoenix kind of are built over the outlines of the ancient irrigation canals that were built by the Hohokam at this city uh, that predates the, the modern city of Phoenix, Arizona. Now the Hohokam, they built pueblos that were amazing as well, but they also had some other features. They built effigy mounds and like the mound builders built. They also practiced what scholars know as the ball game. This was a, a game uh, 
that was pr practiced in, among the Maya, among the Aztecs. It's a used a rubber ball, and the object of the game was to get the ball into a hoop. It was kind of like basketball, but you couldn't use your your hands or your feet to, to move the ball, and the ball couldn't touch the ground. But so here we see a, a degree of continu of uh, contact with civilizations in to the south in in Mexico. Now again, around 1350, the Hohokam civilization begins to decline. Now the people didn't go away. Obviously, they continued to build pueblos, but the complexity, the size and scope, of the, and the size of the settlements declined. And again, we are not really sure whether it was uh, disease or drought or migration, what, what factored into its decline. <clears throat> now, the last topic we're going to discuss today is the, the impact of European colonization on Native Americans. Now, one thing that's important to remember is that when Europeans arrived, all the complex cultures that we've discussed in this lesson had disappeared. And so when the Europeans arrived, all they saw were simple cultures. Now, it is a common historical development that when a complex culture comes into contact with a simple culture, they, the comp people of a complex culture will often view the people of a simple culture as being savages or barbarians or uncivilized, as, as being less of a culture than their own culture. And, and there is this, this belief that they, these people need to be civilized in some way, that they need to be assimilated to the more superior culture. And, and it's interesting is that uh, the ancient ancestors of the English and the French, the people who colonized North America, um, they, their ancient ancestors were Celts. And uh, the Romans, who conquered the Celts 2,000 years ago, or more than 2,000 years ago, viewed them the same way that the English and French would later view the Native Americans, as, as barbarians, as savages that needed to be civilized. Now, now, the fact that Europeans came to view Native Americans as uncivilized meant that they used that attitude to justify moving them off the land. So when the English arrived, since they viewed the, or the French too, when they, since they viewed the Native Americans as subpar, as inferior peoples, they had no qualms about forcing them off the land uh, or forcibly assimilating them to what they saw as their being their superior culture. And uh, this, this, was, uh, this resulted, this situation resulted in the many wars that broke out between Native American tribes and Europeans. Obviously, Native Americans did not want to be pushed, pushed off their lands or be assimilated. But uh, another impact of European settlement and colonization and exploration was that the Europeans introduced the area to a number of diseases that the Native Americans had no resistance to. So when Europeans arrived, they brought measles, they brought smallpox, and these epidemics just devastated the populations of not just North America, but South America as well. And so this, this, actual, this actually resulted in a situation where it was a lot easier for Europeans to, to push off these peoples because their populations had been substantially lowered as a result of these epidemic diseases. Now, Native Americans, though, you have to give them credit. Uh, oftentimes, it's easy just to see the Native Americans as somehow victims. But the fact of the matter was is that you could almost make an argument that the, the, the uh, actions of the Native Americans are kind of a triumph of the human spirit because they adapted to this terrible situation. Remember, disease had killed off much of their people. And since much of the culture of the Native Americans was oral, it wasn't written down, when, when elders died, their, their traditions and their stories and their wisdom died with it. So, so it was a terrible cultural blow to the Native Americans when, when so many people died from these epidemic diseases. But they adapted. They, they, they persevered. They, they learned how to deal with, it, with the Europeans. For example, they, they discovered that European guns and European iron weapons and iron tools like uh, iron tomahawks were superior to the stone tools that they had. And so they, they developed elaborate trading network with Europeans. Euro, uh, Indians learned how to hunt animals and trap animals for their furs and hides and exchange them with the Europeans. And so these very elaborate trading networks were developed. Another way that the Native Americans dealt with the situation was that they had no problem using the Europeans to advance their particular people's interests. So, um, Native American tribes would ally with one European power against another. Uh, 
And there are many examples of this. I'll just give you one example. Uh, when, during the period of colonization, the, the Huron Confederation, which is in what is today Ontario and Canada, they were bitter enemies with the Iroquois Confederation, located in what is today upstate New York and Pennsylvania. And the two sides decided to advance their own interests by forming alliances with separate European powers. The Iroquois aligned themselves first with the Dutch and later the English, while the Huron uh, uh, associated and allied themselves with the French. So effectively, the Indians, the, the Indian tribes, were manipulating the Europeans to advance their own interests. And, and this, this happened again and again. So it's important to remember that Native Americans were, were never simply victims who just accepted their, their plight. They, they fought back, they adapted, they did what they had to do to survive. Now in the, in the next lesson, what we're going to do, in the next lesson what we're going to do is examine the Europeans. We've looked at the Native Americans and now we're going to look at the situation next time, uh, how Europeans, their, their situation and what factors brought them to the New World and the Western Hemisphere.